Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are Scooter Camphor and artist Oppo Tarosian. After Scooter Camphor graduated from Harvard in 1985, she moved to Los Angeles. Were you going to be an artist at that time, Scooter? Well, I think at that time, um, yeah, I was. I actually have, I was a painter, fine artist, but I have my, um, my doctoral work was done in um, curation with museum sciences. At, at Harvard? Mm hmm And where did you go to school before that? Where were you born? I was born in Queens, in New York. Oh, so you were right in your own uh, yeah. territory, Yeah, I was right in my less. own backyard, more or less, yeah. <laughs> and you went, did you go to school before Harvard, or yeah, did I you Yeah, I went, did my undergraduate and my graduate, both. I did, I did both there. Oh, you did? Yeah, they kind of cycle you right in. But Boston, well, Cambridge, Cambridge Boston, yeah. is like the hot spot for food, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is a big food city now. I think when I was going to school, I had no intention of, I mean, I had... You were going to be a food person. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would probably would have told you I'd be, you know, an academic. I mean, that kind of was the plan. Yeah, I see. It was to be in that academic arena. And then what happened when you came here? Um, I came out here because I had a, a gallery um, wanted to represent me. Um, mm. Just so straight I, painting? Mm-hmm. So I came out here uh, to work with the gallery. And I was commuting back and forth, and then um, they said, well, you know, we'll find you a loft to paint and live in, so if you'll stay. And so I said, sure, why not? So I did that, and um, I got into the film business. Because <laughs> the person I was seeing at the time also worked in the film business. Said, oh, it's easy, you'll make great money, you know, you can still paint, blah, blah, blah. And like, you're okay. smart. Yeah, super. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> you know, at 21 years old, I'm like, sure. <laughs> So I did that, and then, you know, as in the late 80s, there was that horrible, horrible film strike in the film business. I mean, the film business right. was crippled for almost nine months. So we had friends that were um, caterers, and I like to cook, and they're like, well, why don't you help us out? You know, it's decent money, and you can be earning some cash. And I'm like, okay, great. That's how you started? Because I wasn't, I didn't like the film business. I didn't like the people, really. It wasn't my thing. So I did, and we used to go to City Restaurant a lot. Uh, and so it was my favorite restaurant. So <laughs> I started writing letters to the girls. Mary Sue and, and Susan. Uh, Susan. Can I have a job? Can I have a job? Well, after like months of letters, I think that somebody, she had someone call me. Oh. See, here we have a dishwashing job. And I'm like, great, what time? So you just took I showed anything up, to get I sh in the restaurant. I showed up at like 7 o'clock the next morning. I'm like, okay, show me what to do. I'm ready to wash dishes. So you had no formal schooling. Did you start learning things from Mary Sue yeah. and I mean, Susan? I, yeah, I was with them for four years. I mean, oh. I, I... You moved from dishwasher, I'm sure. Yeah, I was a horrible dishwasher. <laughs> I think the only reason they didn't fire me was because I showed up every day. <laughs> and then you worked with Wolfgang Puck. Yeah, they actually got me the job with Wolf. Oh, they did? Yeah. So you were lucky. You went to like the top people. I was very lucky. I owe a lot to the girls and it's it's so nice because now it's funny when we, we all sit and we laugh about it because here I started as their dishwasher and now I love them. They're, I'm, they're the best. They're fabulous. You know and now I'm s s seen as a peer so it always you know it, I always get a thrill out of that just because it's it's full circle for me. But you actually they got you a job then with Wolfgang mm -hmm. as a pasta Yeah person. I worked pasta and pastry. Well but did you have to learn about pasta? Here you were. You no, couldn't I use learned, your degrees, could you, no, in the kitchen? Not at all. <laughs> um, of no help. Um, no, I was. I wanted to learn pastry. Uh, and um, Mary Sue's mom, Ruth, was a pastry chef at the city. Uh, so I would work with her on my days off for when um, they needed someone in that department. And I really wanted to be very serious about it. So after about four years of working with the girls, Mary Sue's Susan's, we got you a job working for Wolf at Granita in the in the pastry department. Oh. But Wolf found out that I worked on the line with Susan. You know, I had line experience, so on the weekends they'd have me fill in making risotto on the weekends. Oh, so that's how you started learning? All that. Okay, mm -hmm. we got that. You learned a lot because you were with Wolf for a long time. A couple with of years. Puck. Then Shutters called you and wanted you to create a menu, well, I guess. Well, actually, I, I came in um, 
I had left working for the Wolf Places, and I had never worked at a hotel, so Shutters oh. was opening. <clears throat> I met with their executive chef, who was a really nice guy, Jeff Jackson, and he offered me the position to be the opening pastry person. Oh, that's what you were going to do. So I, I went in to do pastry, and then I was there for about, I don't know, nine months, maybe a little less, and I had met Fred Eric through Mary Sue. Mm, another top and um, chef. Fred kind of courted me away from there, and I was his pastry chef, and I opened Vita. Oh, oh so with you Fred. didn't stay at Shutters very long no. then. <coughs> and Fred uh -huh. took you to Vita and made a big name for himself. Was yeah. Vita already open? No, we had opened. We you opened Vita opened together. It. We I opened Vita with Fred. So, so all the all along the way, do you think you missed anything from not going to a Cordon Bleu school or a culinary well, school? I think. I think what culinary school really affords people to do is I think it gives them a really wonderful vocabulary. And it, it, sh it gives them an overview because really cooking is a craft as much as anything else. And I, I feel you look at it like if you're going to be a carpenter. You don't start out one day and say, okay, I'm going to be a finished carpenter. I had to start out learning how to, you know, carry bricks and, and, and nail, you know, it, nails into wood. You have to start, so it's a craft and you have to learn that. Well, do you learn that in school? I do think they you can to a degree that? from what, but I think you never, I think the most valuable learning experiences come from hands-on and the discipline comes in doing the same thing every single day until you have it right. Mary Sue and Susan used to tell me that you don't know how to do something until you've done it about a thousand times and now you get it. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, can't learn that, is what you're saying. No, I think it's, you get a lot of kids coming out of school, they're like, okay, super, I'm ready to be a sous chef. And I'm like, super, you're ready to be my dishwasher. Mm -hmm. So you're you ready know to be what my the kitchen cook. is like, right. You're ready to stodge, you're ready to apprentice. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, not to say that school isn't valuable, of course it is. There's tremendous value to be placed in any I arena see. where you can learn. I see. But I think work experience is invaluable. One thing, after you'd been with restaurants, you left to take a private chefing job. Yeah, I, I wanted, I was offered this position. A friend of mine uh, who worked at Granita had been working for this family and uh, called me up and said, you know, I'm kind of in a pinch. Can you, what are you doing? And I had just left the position. Oh, you had. So where, really where, where, were, where was this family? Um, it was in the Caribbean. It was in Barbados. It was oh, so. uh, the Rothschild family. Uh huh. So you so had to move English. there? I moved there for about nine months. Oh, you did. So it was a long... Uh... Yeah, well, you figure it was like six months of work, a month of setup, a month of tear down. What happens? How can you get into that slow pace? It must be much slower. It's not at all. I mean, it was like running a small hotel. Is that right? Yeah, because I had the family. And then some weekends, you'd have five guests staying at the estate. Sometimes you'd have 15 or 20 guests staying at the estate for whatever they decided that the family decided to do. And you were on call 24-7. Well, did you have help? Extra? Well, we you had, had a staff. Have, you had a staff? Well, we had a staff. But still, it was a tremendous amount of work because they had five you know, meals a day between tea, high tea, and lunch, and snacks, and meals. So it was like running a small hotel. So it wasn't, it was anything but a slow pace. I thought it was very cushy. It sounded like no. here she's left all this hard work that she's done not up at to all. this point, and she's gone to a little family. No, not at all. It was like running a hotel. It was a lot of work. Did we they give you menus, like, or did you tell her? Um, yeah, I, the Lady Victoria, I mean, there were always things that she wanted or didn't want, you know, and if you could have a prepared an entire meal service, and then she could change it like a half an hour, an hour, for dinner oh. and say, you know what, I decided we don't want to eat that. And you're like, okie dokie. With you know. a smile? Yeah. Oh, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> so after and that finished, you came back and you opened your own place called? Well, no. Actually, oh, you did? I, I oh, did. we got more. I'm pushing too fast. No, so I came back. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And a friend of mine said, I met the woman who owns the Hollywood Hills coffee shop. Oh, that's right. Hollywood Hills. Right. Susan Fine. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And she needs some help with pastry. And I was like, well, okay. And then we got to talking, and she goes, well, you know, I really kind of want to do a dinner service here, but not the coffee shop food. Would you be interested? And I wanted to go back to the regular kitchen. Uh, and I was like, yeah, sure, that would be fun. I thought Hollywood Hills was yours. No. I see. So you did come back to work for someone else again. Mm hmm And you made that uh, Hollywood Hills Cafe into a breakfast, lunch, and dinner well, place? Well, no, it was breakfast and lunch. And it had some dinner, but it was the same as the lunch and breakfast items. Mm -hmm. So we changed the whole format of the dinner to make it more of a fine dining but very accessible. So we did that for about a year and a half or so. And then, um, Take you know, me into it. <laughs> um, I started working for, yet yeah, for someone else and um, 
that was working out for about a year or so, and I was getting antsy. And, you know, Mary Sue and Susan are the ones who really said, you know, you need to really work for yourself now. Um, You're at a point where you need to work for yourself. Open I your own restaurant. Wasn't sure, but they kind of pushed me along, and I met my partner, my business partner. Dana? Mm-hmm, Dana Kasky, through some mutual friends. And uh, we hit it off, and we started playing this restaurant three years ago. Which is called? The house restaurant. The house, lowercase. Right. And it's a craftsman house, it's and you have the downstairs made, three rooms made right. into a dining area and a little patio area. It's very craftsman. When yeah. I came, there were paintings on the wall by Charles Carubian, mm -hmm. and they were wonderful. They mm -hmm. looked great. And, and they really fit the, the nature of the house quite well. They did. And you decided, being an artist now, I can see how you paired that painting and the house together. But you decided it was supposed will reflect homey kind of food. Yeah, we wanted something that was, I mean, it was a house. I mean, it, you, you have to kind of work, I think, in a germane manner to, to where you are. And it is a house. And the kind of food that Dana and I want to do is just very... Uh, you know, I really kind of am reticent about the whole term of comfort food. I yeah, think I didn't want to say comfort food, but I'm going to hold <laughs> up the ultimate comfort yeah. food, and you can tell us why you were. Well, I'm I mean, it, it mac like and this. cheese is what it is. I mean, it's it's you know, it's my family's recipe. It's my my grandpa's recipe. Um, and yeah, that, I guess that is the ultimate comfort food. But we just wanted to make food that we wanted to eat, and that was simple and straightforward. And about what's in season and what's, what's best. What's different about macaroni and ch this macaroni and cheese? Well, I don't know if it's so much different. You can't really reinvent the wheel, as I said er earlier to you. But it's just, I think we feel that, you know, this is just a, a recipe that we really like. I think we use, we try to use only organic product. All the cheeses are organic. Um, they're artisanal. We buy from small um, purveyors or small uh, food crafts people as much as possible. We want to support the small farmer. We, we only try to use sustainable agriculture. So you know exactly what you have in mind mm -hmm. when you do it. This is not dad salad. No, that's a beet salad. Actually, that's just on the new menu right now. So we have all these great little heirloom baby beets. And um, the greens actually come from my friend Ida Cosentino, who ha runs the Veterans Garden in Oh, Westwood. I know that. Ida. It's the best. It's the best. She's <laughs> fabulous. And Gary and all the guys I've been are there. super great. Yeah. And, oh, that's good that And you I do love that. them. And so they grow the little baby greens for me and one of the you know. things that you specialize is because I want to get all these things in before we have to leave veggie pot pie mm -hmm. instead yeah. of a meat right pie. right well you know vegetarians have to eat too and I, I think it's kind of boring just getting a plate of grilled vegetables or that a hunk of tofu good. or right and or then what like about that. your dad's salad oh this is something that my um my dad liked to eat you know he was a big iceberg lettuce guy I was like you know that was <laughs> lettuce okay <laughs> And that's what it was? <laughs> no, well, it's a wedge of, of uh, it's a little head of, of baby um, baby butter lettuce, and we were making at that time a blue cheese dressing with Maytag oh, Maytag blue bread. cheese and, you know, hard-cooked eggs and sliced onions and um, mm. crispy bacon. Just good stuff. And then yeah. after we've eaten all that, we have, ooh, I'm spilling that's, the milk. That's um, right. Cookies and milk. And is this How Now Brown Cow anywhere no, in here? No, uh -uh, these are just the cookies and milk. And they're little teeny wonderful. Yeah, we have all sorts of good things. We've got a, a butterscotch sucker, and we've got fudge, and we've got a little um, rice crispy madeleine. We've got, um, you know, the spitz cookies with the raspberry jam. And, you know, yeah. and those vary. My pastry chef is really great. And you know, and you know about it. pastries because you made them. Do, do you right. give her any? Yeah, we work together on everything. I really like to encourage my staff, I think, because if they have ownership in something, then you take more pride in your work. Boy, you gave us a whole lesson on mm. how to move up and how to move sideways and how to cook our food. Thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, sure. Scooter Camphor, uh, chef at the house restaurant on Melrose. And don't go away because we'll be back with Apo Tarosian, who's here from Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Apo Tarosian, who was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey. He graduated from the Academy of Fine Arts with a bachelor's and a master's degree, and the same year, in 1968, he immigrated to the United States. Uh, where and did you go, and why did you come? Well, I came in 68 uh, to Boston 
the reason of that was my, the mother of my children, my ex-wife. Ah. Her family was settled. Her sister was settled in Massachusetts. Ah. So we settled in Massachusetts. I see. Were you painting then? I had stopped painting probably a year before, even on my way to graduation, because I knew I was coming to the United States, uh -huh. and shipping paintings between continents is a, is a big job, so I had to stop painting. Well, when you got here, did you decide that you were going to be a painter again, because you worked in another business? That's correct. I did not paint. I, I knew painting was a gamble in life. <laughs> and I was, I was a family man. <laughs> I had responsibilities. My child was six months old, so I chose to be a visual designer. Uh -huh. Even though I had no experience in it, I got into that. And uh, first I was an assistant. I learned a job on the spot uh, because visually I have a photographic memory. I can look at you, turn my back, and draw you as you're right? sitting. Right. That's my academic teaching. Uh. So I did that and uh, until 1986 I had my business. It grew. It became a corporation. Oh, so you, had a, you were working at the graphic arts for a long time. That's correct. It was, it was combined of graphic arts with visual design that included from store planning, interior designing, oh. windows, store oh, windows, and trade shows. But you used all of your artistic abilities in those areas. One-tenth of it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was enough to give me a, a, a national uh, business. Oh, I had, I I had done jobs in L.A., in uh, Detroit, in, uh, in St. Louis, New York City and oh. Boston, of course. So that's why then you were able to sell it so easily, because it was a big company. I had I had a clientele, <coughs> and uh, so I could sell to a competitor. Mm -hmm. And that's how oh. I got out of it. I see. And the best thing I did in my life. And then you started painting full time. That is correct. Did you feel like it was a late career move to become a painter then? No, I always carried uh, uh. art in my in my in my world, in I my see. in my mind, except I just couldn't dedicate myself. I can do only one thing at a time. I see. And I dedicate myself fully, 100%, 110% on whatever I'm doing. And now, as an artist, and you are uh, for the many years now. I shouldn't say now, because yeah. you've been painting for a long time. Since 87. Uh -huh. Since 87, I have been painting, and uh, it has been great. And you have dedicated yourself to it. You've shown in museums all over the world art galleries all over the world. You travel with your work. Um, I'm always reading about it, and I always hear that uh, sometimes when a gallery is set up, you have a long video that mm -hmm. you've made explaining your work, and that plays at the same time a show is up. That is correct. Actually, right now, I have a show going on in Iowa, uh -huh. in a university, and uh, I just got a call from them. They're, the students are so excited about the show because they had been watching my video, which is 30 minutes. Just what I said. Yeah. And then I have my biographical information, all the articles and my activities the past couple of years. And the students were so excited. And they asked the curator, when I go back home, which is a week from today, uh, they'll be calling me and they'll interview me on the phone. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But the, the thing is, someone has to do this. Someone has to find these universities. Someone has to really promote you. Do you have a gallery that does that or are you pretty involved in doing that yourself? Uh, most of it is done by me. It's because you have to take an interest in yourself and you have to make it happen. That's correct. That's correct. Um, Unfortunately, it takes a lot of time out of me. Yeah, so I, you can't work in between, that right? That is correct. It's a lot of office work. But I have help. My other half, her name is Jennifer. She's a great lady in my life. And she does most of my correspondence. Oh, so that gets you. I tell her what to write. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's better speller than I am. So. But better than a gallery. I mean, a gallery has so many artists to represent that actually representing yourself and getting major shows because you've had major shows. When I was in Boston, you had a exhibition at the Armenian Library and Museum in Watertown, mm -hmm. beautiful, and then in um, Peabody, P 
creativity. Right. <laughs> but in different places yes, uh, since yes. I've been following your yes. career. Actually, uh, right now it's very exciting because I'm getting more museum shows. Mm -hmm. And that, that is uh, something that I didn't expect. You know, it's like, uh, you know, in, in life, puzzles, they don't fit. Right. But you come a certain age when they see you see puzzles fitting together. Well, one of the reasons I think your work is so unique is that you've stuck with one major theme, and the theme happens to be the bread. The bread. The bread. Tell us what the background is on the bread. Okay. First, I started the bread series as a rebellious art form. I started with toast, and I was kind of studying my society. See, I, I, I love history and I love philosophy, so I combine that in my art. And when, <coughs> I, when I look at my society, I find toast. And actually, uh, one of my shows, a student mentioned uh, Peter Balakian's <coughs> book. Mm -hmm. uh, Black Dog of Faith. Exactly. And the grandmother holds the toast and she says, American. This is very strange. I was talking to Judge Altoon, Alice Altoon, and telling her that we were going to talk about your bread series. And she said when she came over on the boat from Lebanon as a seven-year-old child, she was on the boat, they were given a piece of toast. Mm -hmm. And she looked at it and she said, this is the food in America. It's hard. It's a funny color. It doesn't taste good. What is this? And she said, tell Oppo that story because it, it looks like he's using toast so much. I did use. That was the first period of the bread series, which started 1993. And what I did, like I said, uh, I took the toast, and I have one painting which is six feet by six feet. Right now it's at the Armenian Museum in mm -hmm. Watertown. Uh, that is 214 slices of toast. Okay, do you toast all that bread yourself? I did. You I do. Did. And yes. then how do you preserve it? It takes me a month ah. to preserve it. It's a long process. It's uh, treated from inside out. and uh, it's After it's toasted? Of course. Because you, can, you don't treat the bread before you toast no, it. No, no. The bread itself is, is an organic material. It's alive. Uh -huh. You have to stop the life in it I see. to preserve it, but, to make it immortal. But your philosophy is that the bread is what gives life. That's right. So you have a That's double right. entendre coming here. Well, it's a metaphor. Uh -huh. It's a metaphor. The reason, like I said, the toast was mostly to analyze my society, the fast life, the alienation of human. And then I went into the loaf of bread, mm -hmm. and I started using that. That has much more to do with my historical background. This is, these are the pieces on those the set are, with those loaves. Those are. Those are. And that's what also Judge Altoon was talking about. She said, we came from a society that made big loaves of bread and that's not correct. this sliced kind of thing where yes. the Americans made toast. That's correct. So is that what took you back uh, to make this? Well, the concept was changing. As I said, first it was like, a, a satirical view of my society, of my modern time, uh -huh. then I turn into my roots. I see. My roots, which most Armenians has gone through that, a bread is a very, very valuable item in our society. It's not an ordinary subject right. or object. Right. So my grandparents has died in starvation in 1915. In the Armenian genocide. That's correct. Uh, so, what happened was uh, my grandfather died on the way of starvation, and my grandmother died in Aleppo, mm. Syria, and they were exiled from the uh, seashores of the Marmarian Sea, close to Bandarma, mm -hmm. which I did visit my father's village, by the way. Which is now Turkey, right? It is Turkey. Uh -huh. In that and time, it was the Ottoman Empire. Right. It was not Turkey. No. I Turkey see. was established in 1923. So you lived, you actually lived in Turkey, and one of the things that you had said to me before were you remembered all the textures there, That's correct. the trees and the streets, and, That's correct. and I see those in these pieces that of is work. Correct. 
Well, uh, like I, I mentioned that in my uh, in my videotape too at the colleges, uh, my uh, the city I came from, which is the old Constantinople, mm -hmm. today it's called Istanbul, mm -hmm. which both names are basically Greek. Mm -hmm. which, and you're part Greek I'm too, half Greek, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> uh, Istanbul means Stromboli ah. in Greek, means let's go to the city. Oh, I see. Polis oh, means I see. city. Oh, city right. And Constantinople was, of course, it was named after Constantine. Uh, so the city has 3,000 years of history, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can walk down the street and see a Byzantine wall next to an Ottoman wall. Mm -hmm. And they have a 1,000 years of difference, but they're all historical. And that all came out in your work. That's part of it. Part of it is that, and part of it is my ancestry. Now, in here, for example, oh, I see this picture of these um, of the exactly. young children in the middle now, of the that bread. Is, that is a 1915 photograph, which was taken in uh, Caesarea. Oh, I see. In, in Turkey, in Ottoman Empire, in that time, it's an orphanage. Uh -huh. Now, if you look close to those children's faces, they have been tormented. Mm -hmm. The nine, ten years old child looks like an eighty or ninety year old woman. Mm -hmm. they, they are t tearing their faces. Mm -hmm. So, w in here, what I'm using is earth. Oh, you mix the earth. I mix with the, the earth with the bread, and so there's no color. I don't use color. I use the earth itself oh, as a pigment. I see. Uh, uh, I have a. I have a. Uh, the, the earth itself is a very important subject in my works. I do installations, and one of my favorite stories is I was doing an installation which I use earth mm -hmm. in the middle of the floor. You walk mm -hmm. into the floor, you'll see tons of tons of mounds of earth. So I'm doing this show in Endicott College in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, 98, and students and faculty members going by, they're wondering, what is this man is doing? He's building earth in the middle of the floor. And I have my paintings on the walls. And then, and then you had pieces on top of the earth. I saw an installation that's, photograph of that. That's right. So one of the students came over and says, why dirt? I said, that's not dirt. He says, what is it? I said, that's you. He stepped back and says, am I dirt? I said, no. This is earth, I said. Whatever is within you, is within this earth. And when you're done with life, this is what you're going to be. No. Now you can imagine the vision. I can imagine. Change on his face. Totally. And, when, and it changed on our face. And you brought us the last really fabulous message of your work. And thanks. I'm so glad you came today. Thank, Thank you. you, Oppo Terosian. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll see you next time. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, 917, Los Angeles.